John is the chief product officer. Just an amazing experience to work with the folks on the RoboSoft team. He has stellar track record. I'm always so hesitant to make predictions. Clearly, it's now frustrating. We have to really go look for the motivations of how to solve that problem and get really focused on what is important by staying very closely in touch with the customer. To convert the great vision, it takes a lot of hard work. Hello all and welcome to this edition of Digital Dialogues, where we try to unearth human stories behind tech. In this series, we intend to have candid conversations with challengers, CXOs, digital leaders and founders to understand their life journey and their experiences in crafting digital products. Today, it's my pleasure to meet in person John Malone. John, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Pooja. It's been terrific being here with the team. Uh, my team and I have been here for a few days now, and it's not only been welcoming, but just an amazing experience to work with the folks on the RoboSoft team. John is the chief product officer at The Wonder Project, and he has stellar track record in the media and entertainment as well as consulting industry with big names like EPAM, DirecTV, AT&T, and Comcast. So, uh, John, just to begin with, maybe I think product roadmap is some product management in general is something very close to your heart. I, I know it's, it's core to, uh, you know, not just with the Wonder Project, but with your past experience as well. So we're just curious to understand what brings you to product management as a career and how have you seen this change over the last 30 years of your career? Um, you know, it's interesting. Part of me feels like I've always been in product management and part of me feels like I landed here just by virtue of the work that was happening in the 90s and the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in the, in the middle of the 90s when the internet really started taking shape and there was a web out there to build websites for, um, I started uh, some agency and consulting work with uh, brands and companies that were coming online for the first time, mm -hmm. sort of as everybody was. Chrysler, Reebok, Rockport, Avon, some of these great American brands. Um, and. Uh, over the years, as new capabilities evolved, and then smartphones, and then apps, yeah. um, it, sort of the the discipline of product management kind of developed. Digital project ma product management mm. developed during the '90s and the 2000s, really. Yeah. So uh, I feel like I was sort of a part of it. Um, and when I looked up and realized what we were doing was product management, we then sort of called it that and gave it a shape and a name and added some methodology and started, you know, expanding on it and evolving it. But at first it was website development, website design, app development. Um, and we realized what we were really doing was creating these new consumer products that we had to think about more holistically than how do I sell my goods or how do I deliver this content? Correct. I think it's... I mean, we've seen uh, the evolution of, uh, you know, in a non-digital world, yeah. the idea of product lifecycle and, you know, how it evolved into the digital space. Totally. Uh, so, so maybe for, for people who want to build their careers as a product manager, what defines a stellar product manager for you? Yeah, I mean, curiosity, I think, number one. Um, uh, and even if you're not passionate about the product that you're building, you have to be passionate about trying to find the right product for your customer. So um, uh, I think of that as curiosity mixed with a really large uh, devotion to empathy. So if you can really feel like you want to understand why, what a customer's need is, what a person is missing or looking for, um, and then get super curious about why and how you can satisfy that need, if you're that kind of person, you should consider product management as a career. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's perfect. I think uh, we, we're seeing a lot of product management also as a discipline changing, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, newer digital uh, ideas around, say, AI or, uh, you know, I mean, we, we're seeing product management also defined, redefined yeah. across every decade as we move Absolutely. ahead, right? So, uh, I mean, my question is now coming more towards uh, the empathy and uh, the human-centered design aspect uh, that you brought out, right? So, so how how do you think you have uh, uh, sort of executed this idea of, of voice of customer mm. or empathy, which is core to Robosoft as a brand as well, right, into the products that you, that you built? Um, yeah, I was, uh, I think, really fortunate earlier in my career um, to uh, 
become sort of tight colleagues with a group of people who, um, before we really called things user experience design, okay. um, UX, UI, um, uh, I fell in with a group of people who were, who were sort of at the leading edge of human factors development and, okay. and that kind of research. And we founded a company called Empathy Lab, uh -huh. which ultimately we sold to EPAM, um, which is how I got into that um, world. The, the focus of our company, and at the time we were building websites, the iPhone hadn't launched yet when we started this company, um, quickly moving into uh, mobile app development, but our, our entire reason for being, our value proposition as a group of start, smart yeah. strategists and consultants um, was that we would lead every project and product design, um, product strategy effort with in-person contextual research okay. with users. Okay. Um, we were doing a job for a company at the time called traffic.com. Um, and so we rode in the back seats with commuters for three weeks and saw how they dealt wow. with traffic patterns and what radio stations they listened to and how to sort of help solve that problem for them. Uh, when we were working with the WWE to build the new World Wrestling Entertainment video portal for the first time online, I can't tell you how many wrestling matches I went to and how many fans I sat with. And, uh, you know, when you really start to understand and kind of try to get into their shoes, mm -hmm. even if you can't, but try to understand their shoes, um, that's when we thought we were differentiating in developing and designing great usable products. Um, so that has stuck with me, you know, through the rest of my career. Thank you, John. I think that was really insightful. I think uh, where I'll just shift gears now is on the innovation side of things. So uh, I, I know we connect a lot on design thinking as a concept, mm -hmm. right, which talks a lot about fail fast, fail yeah. forward. So experimenting and prototyping and learning from the real users, like we say. So, I mean, any live examples of what has worked, what has not worked for you in terms of experimenting and innovation on product? Yeah, and I, th I think we're really fortunate now because there's been such a focus in the industry on this that there's a lot of more tools these days to support a lot of experimentation and testing uh, with customers. But I'll, I'll tell you, um, I think I learned it pretty early on in my career when I was at DirecTV. Uh, for a couple of years, I ran the DirecTV Innovation Lab mm -hmm. as, as my primary job. And um, uh, I guess I knew it before from our Empathy Lab experience, uh, but it really became clear that um, you can get a good idea and a hypothesis from okay. talking to users and customers and people about what it is that they need and even putting prototypes in front of them um, until you're having somebody interact with and use the product as if they were a customer, yeah. understanding uh, if what you're testing or what you're experimenting with is really going to work for, for your users, for your customers, okay. um, uh, is tough. And I think a lot of times we gain some some real false comfort in uh, even third party research, if not first right. party. Um, so, you know, when it comes to innovation, I think there's, there's a temptation to do new cool things, which is a lot of fun and it helps yeah. open up a lot of thinking to other ideas. Um, uh, I like to let that go and not constrain it. It's sort of like in that design thinking. Yeah. Um, divergence first. Exactly, right? divergence yeah. first. And so, you know, really try to not stifle ideas. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, in these days, and I'm a startup now, a little different than being in the larger enterprises, um, really get focused on what's important um, and on needs you think you understand a little bit better and focus your time and priority and effort on those things that you think will bring the highest value to the customer. Um, it's, uh, it's a challenge because it's very exciting for product people, for engineers, for designers to do things that are new and different, mm -hmm. which not only doesn't always mean innovative, but it certainly doesn't always mean it's right for the customer. So it's a, it's a fun thing to do. We're gonna have to do a lot of it in our pursuit of finding product market fit when we yeah. go to market. Yeah. Um, and uh, luckily, I think there's a lot of room left to do some amazing things and to innovate, not only on the technical side, but on the experience side and on the content side. Um, so we're really excited about getting into that. Sure, I think that was super insightful, uh, John. The point that I think you also brought up was startup versus large enterprises and how does this 
persona of innovator change with these two contexts, yeah. right? Uh, I know currently you are experiencing the startup world. Last year, all of us have seen globally has been difficult on the funding side. You've seen large enterprises within your career. So, uh, you know, what's the role of a product leader when it comes to, you know, innovating in both these contexts? I'm sure it it has its own nuances, but if you can articulate it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's extremely different. And I think going back to... Um, uh, Clayton Christensen and the Innovator's Dilemma, and mm -hmm. then to New to Big by David Kidder and Bionic, and yeah. the the way the larger enterprises, uh, I, I hate generalizing this way, especially because I've worked at a few of them, and I ran innovation at one of them. Um, the way the larger enterprise tend to innovate um, mm -hmm. is with what I found to be less of a pressure and dire need to get to market, whereas when you're a startup, mm -hmm. Um, that's your survival that's instinct, it, right? right? You're, you're innovating to find your way to market uh, or to find your way to winning in a category. And um, the, uh, you know, I hate to just sort of parrot back what many others much smarter than I have said, is when you're really, really, really good at something and okay. you've got a large business doing that, it's extremely hard to try to do something else. Um, we're not there yet, right? So um, this is my first career opportunity where I've had no legacy technology, mm -hmm. where I've had no legacy business, and we're really starting something from completely scratch. from scratch. Yeah. Um, so it's all innovation right now. Um, so there, you know, I think there's a lot of differences. You have more process and more money and more resources, but I think less accountability to deliver business results mm -hmm. in, in the larger mm -hmm. enterprises with innovation, at least with the non-core innovation. Right. Um, all of these companies are fantastic at innovating on making their networks faster or making um, you know, their support systems um, sort of more proactive and self-healing. Uh, but when it comes to the product experience, I think it's a lot harder. Um, turning a big ship is hard, uh, especially when that big yeah. ship is making a lot of money in that direction. Absolutely. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. So moving to your core, John, the OTT industry. Yeah. We've seen a lot of ups and downs recently on the content side, on the customer acquisition side, on the subscription, ad, all, all of that. <laughs> There's a huge change across the board. Uh, I mean, across geographies, Amazon Prime, Netflix, these are household names now. So, I mean, somewhere there's a feeling that they're reaching some kind of maturity. There's a lot of play for startups with, mm -hmm. you know, a specific focus and, and a value proposition. But there's also, you know, a conversation on where the customers are. So, I mean, on the OTT industry, how do you think will it evolve in the future, your outlook towards? <sighs> Yeah, so I mean, it's such a good question, and uh, and I'm always so hesitant to make predictions, um, and uh, but I do have some, you know, I, I think I, I in my head um, we have to be moving to I'll, I'll call it a more aggregated experience for the customer. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure it looks like what aggregation used to look like, but clearly it's now frustrating to many consumers to have multiple logins, multiple apps, and trying to keep track of where what they're watching is. Yeah. Uh, and it's a real problem for a lot of people. And when I say it's a real problem, it's not the world's biggest problem, right? So we have to really go look for the motivations right. of how to solve that problem in a way to get people really excited about it. Um, so I do think there is more consolidation aggregation, the Amazon channels model, mm -hmm. the premium add-ons and YouTube, um, where it almost, you know, what's old is new. It looks a little like when the cable bundle started and then you yeah, could bolt on yeah. HBO and Showtime and Cinemax. Yeah. So I think we'll see some of that. I also think we're going to see a lot more specialty services hmm. that are uh, people who own or want to create um, a content library that wouldn't be a mass market type of right. an offering. And right. maybe Netflix isn't interested in a prime, but there's 200,000 people maybe who would be. And finding ways to bring these smaller experiences mm -hmm. profitably, because it's hard to run these businesses yeah. even at scale. Um, I think we'll see more of that, and we mm -hmm. see some of them today starting to be a little successful. Um, and so uh, I also think we'll, we'll start to see a little, well, we're starting to see right now a bit of a pullback on how much new originals uh, everybody's spending right. on until right. we're sort of maximizing some of the assets that we have already. Yeah. Um, so. That's interesting. I, I think there's good news for the customer on the horizon, but I think to get there, we're still in for some more confusion. And consolidation makes a fall. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, 
Sure. Uh, yeah, just just more on the OTT side again. I mean, we're also seeing a lot of connected industries, right? Mm. E-commerce on the other side, tech on one side, you know. So there's a lot of amalgamation where, you know, of uh, entertainment has become more and bigger. more wider and bigger. Yeah. So, so do you think these platforms will sort of move beyond the classic idea of entertainment? Yeah, I, I mean, I think... I think the great thing about the internet and application development and even uh, more so now where the promise of um, easier coding or no code solutions or AI aided coding or co-piloting and the, uh, I think we could see more uh, experimentation of expanding a video or an entertainment experience to be more. Um, the adjacencies seem to be the closest. We see what Netflix is doing with gaming. Yeah. It only makes sense that they're trying with that. We're, you know, so we'll, I think we'll see a bunch of that. We okay. see some of the other uh, OTT SVODs bringing in live news. Um, really smart, makes a lot of sense. In the US, we've just seen a consolidation or an announcement of a new streaming service that will bring live sports from the various uh, rights holders to a single experience. So I think you know we're still moving out of live television yeah. where news, live events, and sports really now are the only things that rule the day. Correct. Uh, I think as we see that going, that's sort of changes OTT a little more. Uh -huh. That's how we might see these larger, rounder, uh, I don't want to call them mega products, but you know, products that offer more than one kind of experience. Um, I think it's going to be hard to make the transition, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but there's good news coming. Um, I think it's going to take a while before we really figure out how to do that in a way that you can both be entertained when you want to be entertained without being interrupted um, or, or being difficult to get that pure entertainment value. Perfect. John, what you're also trying to say, you know, with, with the gaming and e-commerce and edtech is what are the needs of the communities yeah. that we are really catering to? And defining these communities, you know, catering to their needs is yeah. the bottom line at the end of the day. So uh, I know you're also working on a project which is very closely connected to a community uh, idea. But how do you see, you know, communities evolving around the ODD products and platforms that are being built? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's exciting to see what's happening right now uh, in that area because this is a place where there's a lot of experimentation going yeah. on. I think there's a lot of things that aren't working and a lot of things that are. Um, the bigger OTT streamers are probably not ripe to take advantage of this because they serve everyone. Correct. Um, but those specialty services we were talking about that are really taking legs and growing, and there's so many more of them coming out, the more um, you're specialized, the more a community you might have to immediately tap into. Yeah. Yeah. And even if you have a start, you have the ability to start building community around yeah. your content, your product, your value proposition, yeah. whatever that might be. Um, and we know that entertainment brings people together. And we know that in, in the particular space of OTT, it, there people love to talk with each other about what am I watching? What are you watching? Yeah. Did you see that last episode? The old water cooler talk, which doesn't happen right. so much anymore around water coolers, especially after Virtual COVID. Water coolers, There's almost that no means. water coolers anymore. <laughs> so um, I think there we, we see a lot of data suggesting that there is a need. Yeah. Uh, a, a move for people who maybe feel a little more isolated in the world today than they did five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whatever kind of common affinity you can sort of build this community around, be it entertainment or yeah. music or a book or love of nature. Sports. Um, at sports, Great. of course. Yeah. People love to be a part of something. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll see more entertainment properties looking for a community of people who want to be closer to that content. Yeah. Um, we've seen some interesting things happen around pieces of content specifically, like what Dallas Jenkins and The Chosen have done on hmm. um, hmm. building that community around yeah. that property. Um, I think it's harder to think of how you do that of a brand that serves multiple genres, uh, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, but there are a number of communities out there um, that are really building around the content, um, wedding communities, uh, car drivers, that have video content and, and sort of uh, community uh, interactions mm -hmm. in the same experience. Right. I think most of it, what we're seeing is that these communities form in the social, uh, the, the social media apps around a community in Facebook or Instagram yeah. or TikTok. Yeah. Um, but this is all evolving and I think technology is helping to identify opportunities. Uh, but more than ever, the consumers have a way to express their interests. So, yeah. 
I'm looking to listen as much as I can, take as much feedback as possible, and then start to craft, you know, how do we bring the experience of togetherness around the experience of watching uh, entertainment. Perfect. I want to, uh, you know, get to the execution part of mm. it, right? Because, I mean, all of us have been in the industry and, and we see that to convert the great vision, uh, you know, that leaders have into reality, it takes a lot of hard work yeah. and planning and thinking and organizing teams and so much of yeah. it. So, so again, Thank you just, for now giving me a panic attack in the middle of, <laughs> yes, that's my job. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, just uh, on, on the execution side, how, how far are you, how are you, what are the learnings for, you know, maybe these specialist sort yeah. of more OTT players that we will see, uh, you know, coming on the horizon, any learnings that you would like to share on the execution side, particularly the engineering, the design, the sure. data, all of that. I think it's like everything um, when it comes to execution is if you can get really focused on what is important. Um, and the way we are doing that is by staying very closely in touch with the customer, with the user. Um, by the way, I hate the words customer and user, but I, when we're talking tech, I'm happy to use them. Um, yeah. uh, that um, we stay in close touch and really understand what they want and stay laser focused. There's mm -hmm. a fifth, uh, here, here's how I say it, and I credit one of my old bosses for this. There's no shortage of ideas, right? The idea factory is always open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the real discipline is ensuring you're laser focused on what's most important to the customer mm -hmm. so that you can deliver that while then seeing what else you can do to bring more value. Sure. Um, if you can't do what's most important in the value proposition, it doesn't matter what else you're doing on the side, yeah. you're, yeah. you're not gonna give the experience that your customer's looking for. So um, we have stayed, uh, and, and I, uh, I think you can attest to this, we have tried to stay extremely true to an MVP approach yeah. um, I don't believe what we will launch with will be our MVP, but we will s make sure that that core experience mm -hmm. works flawlessly right. uh, before we start too much work on executing our vision uh, around that. You know, it's sort of a culmination of a lot of years of doing some things right and some things wrong and, and leaning into the, the learnings of the things I, I thought I could have done better. Um, but it comes down to really just a couple of points, I think, and, and really executing on those points is tough too, but. Um, first, I always find I need to surround myself with the right people. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have a team you can go yeah. to battle with, yeah. it, you know, you're in trouble. So um, identifying partners, key members of your team, um, really important. Um, yeah. You know, follow all the typical things that people would, much smarter than me would say, you know, never be the smartest person in the room, hire people who aren't like you, got it. Um, but then, that's sort of the easy part of the hard part. Mm -hmm. The harder part is forming a team culture yeah. and really yeah. focusing on a high-performing team mm -hmm. before, while focusing on how is it that this team is gonna get from A to Z. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have myself, and I've seen many others, <laughs> fail at execution um, by thinking, by putting the right people in the room together, mm -hmm. you're gonna succeed. And you really have to focus on building culture um, and staying like incredibly true to it, even when it hurts and when it's hard. Um, and then keep that team super focused in one direction. Yeah. Uh, and as a startup and, and in any consumer product world, especially digital, you're gonna have left and right turns and pivots and mm -hmm. you're gonna learn things and need to change, et cetera. Um, but understand what's important at any given time, what's most important, and make sure you're executing on that and not getting distracted by all the other things you may want to do or experiment with or try. There's always ways to do that, yeah. but it's a blessing to have limited resources like a startup because yeah. we don't have as many temptations to, to distract get distracted. Yeah. So I think, you know, find the right people, partners, employees, teammates, um, focus on that group of people becoming a well-oiled delivery machine and have a focus of what success looks like and, you know, celebrate getting to the finish line. Excellent. I think that's that's a brilliant takeaway for for our viewers here. Um, I think yesterday you you brought out a very important point, uh, John, that that stayed with me, which is, uh, you know, it's it, the engineering teams sometimes listen to the customers through the product yeah. teams, right? So, and and I know that you're trying to change that, uh, and I think that is a very essential piece of execution. So, if you want to just talk about that, yeah, this I mean, this goes way back to the company Empathy Lab that I was a part of. Um, 
everybody who is charged with delivering something special for an audience should have exposure to the audience. Yeah. Um, should use their competitors' products. Should use your own product. Right. Um, and so I am committed to ensuring that I'm not a go-between, that my team, the product team, is not a go-between to the engineering team. Um, that sort of business will deal with the customer yeah. and tell engineering, it's just, it doesn't work. Okay. We deliver in Agile, which is the only way to do this. Yeah. Um, and the more our team who are writing code uh, hears firsthand from our customer what's important, the more I have confidence that they'll deliver a higher quality solution yeah. because the whole team will develop the empathy firsthand rather than through presentations and webinars. And it's not lost in translation, right? And it's not lost in translation. That, that is, you know, we all know that swing cartoon, Correct. right? This is what yeah. they asked, this is what they thought, this, this is what, what the consumer got. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you have a much harder, you have a, a much better shot of not doing that if your engineering team has heard from your customer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. super important. <laughs> Great. Um, John, I think I, I have to express a lot of gratitude for, for the Robosoft team, mm. uh, you know, being able to work on this project together. So, I mean, just to, to share some experiences of, of working together across, I think, boundaries mm. and time zones and, you know, teams it's and awesome. cultures. Yeah. And I think we've, we've managed to build a phenomenal culture uh, that, that I think comes from the top, from you and your team. And, you know, that, that collaboration is very well visible. So. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that right now things are really working well. Yeah. Um, we have a huge mountain to climb and we have to find product market fit and we have to build an audience. Like the stuff we're doing now is hard. Yeah. It gets a lot harder, right? So um, uh, really exciting. One of the things uh, I, I have so much gratitude for is how much each member of this team leans in and has passion for what we're trying to do. Um, and I really think that makes all the difference in the world. No. I think the, the connection to, to the vision is yeah. all that matters. So, John, let me challenge you with a rapid fire. Okay. The, the idea is to not give you any time to think. So, let's see what's on top of your mind. Okay. We'll go with the first one. What's your all-time favorite series, movies? Uh, series, The Office, The mm -hmm. Steve Carell Office. And movie, uh, anybody who knows me would say The Big Lebowski. I would probably put Diner right on okay. top of that. Excellent. Anything that you're watching right now? What's on your I just started The Crown. I must be the last person in the world to start it, and yeah, it's fantastic. I'm done with it yeah. already. <laughs> Great. Uh, what's your preferred mode of watching? Um, theater. Uh, I go to the movie yeah. theater two to three times a week. I see wow. everything on the big screen. It is how I like to watch entertainment. Um, and then on the big screen. I'm not a phone watcher. Fantastic. I think that, that says a lot about yeah. your persona. <laughs> Are you a binge watcher or a scheduled? I'm a schedule watcher. I can watch maybe two episodes in a row of something. Um, I long for the days when you used to have to wait for the cliffhanger to, you know, seven yeah. days for the answer, right? Yeah. So I love that. That's part of my enjoyment of the series. Perfect. Now that you're in India, any Bollywood... <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I have Bollywood aspirations now that I've been here. But to no, act. oh, please, just to dance and sing in the costumes. Yeah. Um, I don't watch it. I mean, of course, I, I see a lot of it, but I couldn't tell you the name of anything. I do know one director here, Homi Adhijani. He made a movie called Being Cyrus, mm -hmm. um, and so I'll say that's my favorite movie. We Not should, quite Bollywood. we should possibly find some time to to get into a theater here and I'm watch a Bollywood you. film together. Definitely. <laughs> And if you had a chance to make your own movie, I know you had aspirations in your early days, yeah. but what would it be now? It would have to be some kind of uh, fantasy, renaissance period, swords and swashbucklers, mm -hmm. and maybe some magic and sorcery. Wow. <laughs> Lord of the Ringsy, maybe. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. That sure. was rapid enough. Although rapid I don't enough. have a hamper for you. <laughs> Thank you for your time, John. I personally enjoyed the conversation. I, I can't thank you enough for, for spending the entire week with us here in Bangalore and accommodating this conversation. I'm sure it's extremely useful for our audience, for, for the product managers to be, the existing product managers, the, the engineering teams, the design teams. It's always better to hear it directly from the practitioner. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been wonderful, not only here uh, for this conversation, but for the whole week. Uh, truly memorable, and I'm looking forward to continuing to do great things together 
uh, RoboSoft and the Wonder Project.